Hi everyone, this is Sarah at Daisyville and welcome to our webinar. Today we'll be discussing EOR requirements and payment timelines. This webinar is the third in our Workers' Comp 101 series. The first webinar covered the very basics of Workers' Comp, including payers, the DWC, the WCAB, and the legislative process. And then the second webinar covered how to correctly and compliantly submit an original bill for Workers' Comp. If you didn't attend the first two webinars, recordings of these webinars can be found on our website in the webinar library under resources. The videos and slides are free to watch and download. They are a great framework for the other webinars in this series. Our next webinar will cover second review appeals. And in January, we will start the year with our annual OMFS webinar where we'll review changes to the various fee schedules for 2019 dates of service. A little bit about us, Daisy Bill makes smart billing software to help people manage the complexities of workers' comp billing and payment. Workers' comp is challenging and our software is designed to make it easier. We offer three software solutions. First is a complete end-to-end -end revenue cycle management system that electronically submits and tracks workers' comp bills. And this table shows how quick and effective our electronic billing is. Most of our largest payers, on average, submit payment to Daisy Bill clients in 15 days or less. And when done correctly, workers' comp electronic billing works and works fast. For those who don't need the full scope of our billing software, we have the Work Comp Wizard. The wizard includes seven critical features to help California workers' comp professionals succeed. The wizard features the very popular OMFS calculator, which instantly calculates reimbursements for six medical fee schedules, as well as the medical legal fee schedule. And finally, we offer our essential tools. Essentials Tools subscribers can create second review appeals and request for authorization in seconds, and can also use our task management system to track payer responses to RFAs and SBRs. So let's get started with today's webinar on EORs and payments. First, I'm going to give you a bit of context for EORs and payment. Then I'll cover breach of duty and filing a lien. Next, I'll go over EOR timelines and information requirements, including BARCs. The last topic will be timely payment requirements, and I'll finish up by answering some of your questions. And don't worry about taking notes today. After the webinar, we'll send out an email with the slides, as well as a recording of the video as well. The main law that governs medical treatment for California workers is Labor Code 4600. The first paragraph of this law requires an employer to pay for all treatment, quote, reasonably required to cure or relieve the injured worker from the effects of his or her injury, end quote. And you'll see this slide often in our 101 series as the code is the foundational code for workers' comp billing and payment. This important labor code lists the medical care an employee is obligated to pay for when an employee is injured at work, including any necessary related services. And per a recent lawsuit, the Department of Industrial Relations filed a brief stating that Labor Code 4600, quote, specifically includes interpreting services within the medical treatment, end quote. And according to the DIR, an employer is obligated to pay for interpreting services when the interpreter provides the service during medical treatment. This is the life cycle of a workers' comp bill. In our last webinar, we discussed the requirements of submitting a timely and complete original bill for services. And in that webinar, we learned that an original bill must be submitted within 12 months from the date of service. This timely billing requirement applies to all providers of services, including physicians, hospitals, pharmacies, interpreters, copy services, transportation services, and home health care services. And timely bill submission applies to all dates of service on or after January 1st, 2017. 
And furthermore, and most importantly, Labor Code 4603.2 clearly instructs that no payment is due for untimely bill submission. Quote, the request for payment is barred unless timely submitted. Today, we will focus on the employer's claims administrator's response or obligations to respond to the provider's original bill with an explanation of review, that's known as an EOR, and the payment. Now, in group health, the equivalent document to an EOR is known as an explanation of benefits or an EOB. In our first webinar, Master the Basics, we discuss the role of the claims administrator. As a quick recap, both self-insured employers and insurers must designate a claims administrator to manage all aspects of an injured worker's claim. The claims administrator also sends the necessary reports to the state. A self-insured employer or an insurer may act as their own claims administrator and handle their own injury claims. Or these entities may choose to hire a third-party administrator, known as a TPA, to act as the claims administrator. Throughout this webinar, the terms employer and claims administrator will be used, but ultimately the employer or the employer's insurer is responsible for the actions of its claims administrator. Before I get started, I want to address our number one most frequently asked question about today's topic. And that was, what do we do when we do not receive a compliant or timely explanation of review? A provider's only recourse is to file a lien within 18 months of the last date of service. Per California regulations, a provider is allowed to file a lien for non-IMR or IBR disputes. So this means the lien is allowed for disputes not related to the amount of payment. Specifically, when a claims administrator fails to perform its regulated duties, the regulation instructs the provider to file a lien asserting that the claims administrator, quote, waived any objection to the amount of the bill because the defendant allegedly breached a duty, end quote. This means full payment is due when a claims administrator fails to comply with its duties. If the claims administrator breaches its duty, the claims administrator cannot object to any amount of the bill. And even more specifically, this regulation instructs a provider to file a lien when a claims administrator breaches its duty as prescribed by Labor Code Sections 4603.2 and 4603.3 or the rules of the administrative director. So today we will parse Labor Code 4603.2. As we go through the requirements of this Labor Code, please keep in mind that a lien is allowed when a claims administrator fails to perform its mandated duties. We'll also parse Labor Code 4603.3. And again, a provider can file a lien when the claims administrator fails to comply with this Labor Code. As a reminder from webinar number one, George Parasoto is the administrative director of the DWC. The administrative director promulgates the rules that providers and claims administrators must follow. Today, we will review these DWC guides. If a claims administrator fails to follow the rules in these guides, a provider can file a lien and assert breach of duty by the claims administrator. We hear from so many providers about not receiving an EOR or receiving incomplete EORs, or that without, without an EOR, they can't proceed with a request for second review or independent bill review, IBR. Providers, this is not allowed, and you can very easily file a lien asserting breach of duty. All of the EOR rules we discussed today apply to all original bills for medical treatment and services provided to an injured worker under Labor Code 4600. Let's turn to the specifics regarding EORs, beginning with EOR timelines. Per Labor Code 4603.2, quote, payment shall be made by the employer with an explanation of review pursuant to section 4603.3, end quote. The time requirement for sending an EOR depends on several factors including the bill uh, submission method, whether or not the bill is contested, as well as the type of employer. 
For bills submitted electronically, the employer's claims administrator must send an EOR within 15 working days of receipt of the electronic bill. The 15 working days is not an optional time requirement. It's the law per Labor Code 4603.4. For electronic billing, both claims administrators and providers must follow the rules in the DWC Electronic Medical Billing and Payment Guide. For electronic bills, the rules require a claims administrator to send a timely electronic EOR. In Daisyville, every electronic bill includes a cover sheet alerting the claims administrator of the date that the electronic EOR is due back. In this example, the first date shown, September 19th, 2018, is when the original e-bill was transmitted and received. And then the second date, October 11th, 2018, is the date the electronic EOR is due. In Daisy Bill, the bill history shows these same compliance due dates. Per Labor Code 4603.2, a non-electronic, uncontested bill requires an EOR in payment within 45 days for private employers. And an uncontested bill means that the bill reimbursement is precisely the same amount as the bill charges. Here's an example of an uncontested bill. The paid amount was exactly the same as the billed amount. Therefore, the claims administrator is not contesting any of the billed charges. If the bill is sent on paper, and the employer is a private employer, and the bill is uncontested, the claims administrator must send the EOR with the payment within 45 calendar days of receipt of the paper bill. Per Labor Code 4603.2, for government employers, an uncontested bill requires an EOR in payment within 60 days. The 60-day EOR in payment only applies to government employers. For paper bills, if the claims administrator contests a portion of the bill, the claims administrator must send the provider an EOR within 30 calendar days of receipt of the original bill. The 30-day rule applies to both private and government employers when the claims administrator contests the bill charges and does not reimburse the provider exactly the billed charges. An EOR is required within 30 days if the claims administrator denies either a portion of the bill or the entire bill. When the claims administrator believes a bill is incomplete, the EOR is due within 30 days of receipt of the original bill. For incomplete bills, California law requires the EOR to state all additional information required to adjudicate the bill for payment. Quote, an explanation of review that states an itemization is incomplete shall also state all the additional information required to make a decision. End quote. So we've just covered the time requirements for EORs. Now we move on to EOR information requirements. These EOR requirements apply to all EORs issued by a claims administrator. These are separate requirements for, or there are separate requirements for MedLegal EORs. And these EOR requirements apply to all original bills for medical treatment and services provided to an injured worker under Labor Code 4600. Now, Labor Code 4603.3 requires an employer to, quote, provide an explanation of review in the manner prescribed by the administrative director, end quote. To implement the Labor Codes, the DWC and its administrative director issue regulations and rules, including those contained in the DWC Medical Billing and Payment Guide. The DWC Guide has detailed rules that claims administrators must follow when paying workers' compensation bills. Failing to follow these rules listed in the guide is a breach of duty by the claims administrator. The DWC guide applies to bills submitted by healthcare providers, defined in the guide as providers of medical treatment, goods, or services. 
In the guide, Appendix B lists the specific informational requirements for an EOR. The information requirements in Appendix B apply to both paper and electronic EORs. The Appendix B requirements also apply to final EORs for second review appeals. Appendix B explicitly states that there is no standard paper form or format for EORs. As long as all the required information is included, the EOR could be handwritten on a post-it. Now let's turn to Table 3 of Appendix B, which contains specific data item requirements. The headings for Table 3 are pretty self-explanatory. In the third column, if there's an R in that column, it means the data item is always required. An S means the data item is required depending on the situation. And an O means it's optional. We aren't going to go over each data item, but we want to highlight some of the most important EOR elements. First, the date of review is required. And additionally, if a payment is made, the EOR must include the payment information, which is either the paper check number or EFT tracer and the payment date. In this compliant EOR example from Sedgwick, the EOR includes the required payment details, including the method of payment, the payment ID number, which we dummied up here just to preserve the confidential information, as well as the payment date. In this non-compliant EOR, there's reimbursement for $145.60, but no payment details, such as the payment method or the ID. If a lien were filed, the provider would assert breach of duty per the rules of the administrative director and demand full payment of the billed amount. Every EOR must also list the payer name and payer address. For contested bills, the EOR must also include the payer contact name and phone number. As we explained earlier, when an employee is injured at work, an employer is obligated to pay for all medical care, including any necessary related services. And there are two ways an employer can pay these bills. First, the employer can elect to be self-insured, which means the employer pays the medical treatment bills. And in this EOR, the risk provider is the employer itself, the city and county of San Francisco. So this EOR is for a self-insured government employer. Instead of being self-insured, the employer can purchase workers' comp insurance, which means the insurer pays the medical treatment bills. This is an AIG EOR, and the employer on this one is JCPenney, but the payer is the insurer, which is American Home Assurance Company. If the payment is reduced due to a PPO or an MPN contract, the EOR must include the name of the PPO or MPN and the ID number, which is either the state license number or the certificate number. This is a compliant EOR example from Corvell, where the provider was reimbursed less than the OMFS due to a discount contract. And appropriately, the EOR includes the name of the network, the network branch, and the contract number. In this non-compliant EOR, Athens applied a PPO reduction, but fails to list the PPO contract name or PPO ID number. This is particularly egregious as it appears bill review is simply slashing reimbursement without justification. If a lien were filed, the provider would assert breach of duty per the rules of the administrative director and demand full payment of the billed amount. According to Table 3, the EOR must always include the billed procedure code and billed units sent on the original bill. If claims administrator's bill review changes the build codes and or the units, the EOR must also list the replaced paid code and units. So in this example, the provider billed for one unit of 99214 on a CMS 1500, and Corvell changed the build code to 99213, 
and properly recorded that 99214 was originally billed, but that it downcoded it to a 99213. Conversely, on this EOR, AmTrust downcoded the provider's original 99214 to a 99212, but the EOR does not state the originally billed code. So one can't help but wonder if this is an attempt to mislead the provider into thinking the provider originally billed a lower reimbursing 99212 instead of the originally billed 99214. Obviously, this is non-compliant and a provider could file a lien asserting breach of duty of the rules of the administrative director. When bill review makes an adjustment to the bill, or if there is a denial of bill charges, the EOR must include both the DWC bill adjustment reasons and the explanatory messages. So let's take a few minutes to review the DWC bill adjustment reason codes. Here at Daisy Bill, we like to call these adjustment codes BARCs for short. Appendix B, Table 3, specifies that workers' comp EORs use DWC bill adjustment reason codes and DWC explanatory messages instead of the claims adjustment reason codes or remark advice remark codes. Sorry, remittance advice remark codes. The DWC developed BARCs to better explain bill adjustments in relation to California workers' comp billing and payment rules. And per the EOR requirements, the DWC BARC must be used when a bill is contested. These BARCs are found in Appendix B, Table 1 of the DWC Medical Billing and Payment Guide, from pages 59 through 109. There are 11 BARC categories and a total of 133 BARCs. And this table summarizes the categories and the associated BARCs. I'll go through one of the BARCs, G10, as an example of how to use this table. In the first column, the DW instructs claims administrators to use G10 when a bill is submitted without the necessary documentation. For missing documentation, in the next column, the DWC requires this explanatory message with BARC G10, quote, we cannot review this service without necessary documentation. Please resubmit with indicated documentation as soon as possible, end quote. In the fourth column, the DWC instructs the claims administrator to identify the documentation or report necessary for bill processing. And in this EOR, the G10 BARC was applied with the missing documentation explanation message However, the EOR fails to identify the missing documentation. So without identifying the missing documentation, a provider cannot know what document to submit for bill processing. Rather than responding to this bill, the provider could file a lien asserting breach of duty by the claims administrator and request the full and final payment of the bill. The last three columns of Table 1 is a crosswalk between the DWC BARCs and explanatory messages and the equivalent CARC and RARC combinations used in electronic EORs. If used correctly by claims administrators, the DWC's 133 BARCs are an excellent, well-thought-out system for claims administrators to communicate the reason a healthcare provider's bill is contested, denied, or considered incomplete. Before we move on to timely payment requirements, I want to go over breach of duty and why it is advantageous for providers in the appeals process. First, a lien and full payment of the bill is the explicit resource the DWC allows when a claims administrator fails to adhere to the labor codes or the rules that we've reviewed today. An untimely electronic EOR is a breach of duty by the claims administrator. An untimely paper EOR is a breach of duty by the claims administrator. Failing to include all of the required EOR information is also a breach of duty. And filing a lien is a far easier process to manage than submitting an IBR. First, a lien can be filed within 18 months of the last date of service, 
which is a much more generous time frame than an IBR, which must be filed within 30 days of the final EOR. Next, a lien only costs $150, and a single lien and lien fee covers all of the bills where there was a breach of duty. This is far cheaper when compared to an IPR where each bill requires an IVR and a separate $195 fee. In Daisy Bill, if a claims administrator fails to send a timely EOR, a task is automatically created to follow up on the bill. In this example, a second review appeal was submitted, but the provider did not receive a timely final EOR. A no response task was automatically generated to a designated member of the billing team. The team member can click the lien button, which would change the status of the bill to a lien status, and add this bill to a list of bills eligible for a lien for this particular injury. For each injury, Daisy Bill tracks all bills assigned a lien status. For this injury, here are the four bills assigned a lien status. When it comes time to file the lien, it's simple to add all four bills to the lien. For the lien, the bill history provides all the necessary irrefutable proof of untimely EORs sent by the claims administrators. Daisy Bill also makes it easy to file a lien if the EOR information is non-compliant. In Daisy Bill, when a payment is posted, a payment received task is automatically assigned to a dedicated member of the billing team to review for payment accuracy. And if a claims administrator fails to include all of the required EOR information, the Daisy Biller can add a note to the payment received task. In our example, we added the note, EOR is missing PPO required contract information. The bill history records our example reason for the lien and records that the bill has been assigned a lien status. Then it's simple to click the lien button to add this bill to a list of bills eligible for a lien for the injury. For easy reference, when you file the lien, remember to upload the non-compliant EOR to the bill. A compliant EOR must be both timely and include all the required information. A late EOR, no EOR, or an EOR that doesn't have every required data item are all non-compliant. The regulation clearly penalizes claims administrators for non-compliant EORs with full payment of the amount of the bill. Now let's move on and review the timely payment requirements. All of the timely payment rules we will review apply to all medical treatment and services provided under Labor Code 4600 to an injured worker. The payment deadlines depend on whether the bill is med legal or not, whether it's electronic or non-electronic, and if non-electronic, whether the employer is private or governmental. For electronically submitted bills, the payment requirement is 15 working days for both private and government employers. And per Labor Code 4603.4, the 15 working days is a requirement and it is not optional. For bills submitted non-electronically, so on paper, the payment due date is dependent on the type of employer. For private employers, payment is due within 45 days of receipt of the paper bill. Per Labor Code 4603, the 45-day payment requirement is the law for private employers. It's not optional, it's not a suggestion. For state government employers, when a provider submits their bill non-electronically, payment is due to the provider within 60 days of receipt of the paper bill. And again, per Labor Code 4603, this 60 day payment requirement is the law for government employers. So what happens when these payment deadlines are not met? That's when penalties and interest are due. And later on in the Workers' Comp 101 series, we'll give a webinar on how penalties and interest work. Now I'll briefly cover med legal EORs and payment. First, for med legal bills, the EOR is due within 60 days after receipt of the complete bill. And that's whether it's filed electronically or on paper. 
Labor Code 4622 governs med legal EORs, and this labor code requires the claims administrator to follow the EOR requirements of Labor Code 4603.3. This is the same labor code that we reviewed earlier, but the administrative director has not issued additional EOR rules for med legal bills. When issuing an EOR for medical legal bills, payers must simply follow the requirements of this labor code, which lists six pieces of information that must always be included in an EOR for a medical legal bill. Number one is an itemization of the billed procedure codes. Two is the amount paid. Three is the reason for any adjustment, change, or denial. Four, if the bill is denied, the reason for the denial. Five, if the bill is incomplete the necessary additional information. And finally, number six is contact information if the bill is contested. Just like an EOR for medical treatment or services for med legal EORs, as long as all the required information is included, the EOR can be in any form or any format. Payment for med legal bills is also due within 60 days. The time requirement for payment of medical legal bills is found in Labor Code 4622. For med legal breach of duty, instead of filing a lien, file a non-IBR petition under CCR 10451.1. And Daisy Billers, if you send medical legal bills, we can help you with these peti petitions. Reach out to one of us directly. So this is the end of the scripted webinar. Before we turn to your questions, I want to go over a few announcements. The next webinar in our Workers' Comp 101 series is about second review appeals, and it's going to be on Thursday, November 15th. A request for second review is the mandatory first step in the appeal process for an improperly denied or an incorrectly paid bill. And when you register for the next webinar, don't forget to ask us questions. And as always, after today's webinar, a survey will appear in your browser window. We love reading your survey responses. We might even obsess over them. So please take 30 seconds to answer the four quick questions. And later this week, you'll receive an email with the links to watch a video recording of this webinar, as well as the link to download the slides. You don't need to ask us for them. I promise we'll send you that email that will include the link to download the slides. So let's start with some of the registration questions first, and then we'll get on to your questions that you've asked today. Here's our first registration question. Rosa asks, what recourse do you have when you send a bill to the correct address with a proof of service but no EOB or denial is sent. Then you send another letter with payment inquiry and there's still no response and the adjuster does not call you back. So as we've covered, no EOR means the claims administrator breached its duty to compliantly process your bill. Therefore, you can file a lien to get reimbursed the full amount of your bill. Next question is from Jennifer. Jennifer says, when bill review says the carrier, for example, Amtrust or Farmers, did not forward the appeal documents, they insist that their hands are tied, that it is the provider's obligation to resubmit or to call the adjuster and tell them that they have to forward our appeal for review. Is this true? So it's the claims administrator that's ultimately responsible for the compliant processing of your appeal. Bill review simply works for the claims administrator. If you have proof of submitting a request for second review to the claims administrator, then you can prove breach of duty because your claims administrator failed to timely process your appeal. If you mail your second reviews, always use a method that includes proof of service. And if you're a Daisy Biller, you don't need a proof of service. In the bill history, you have your proof of submission and the accompanying documentation, including the date of your submission, as well as the date of receipt by the claims administrator. You can also see the compliance due dates for the second review submission. If you receive a no response task for the second review, you know that a breach has occurred. 
Next question, Alicia asks, what laws or regulations are in place when a claims administrator decides to not properly process your claim or bill with an EOR and sends you a denial letter instead? If the claims administrator denies your bill, the claims administrator must notify you with an EOR within 30 days. A denial letter is compliant if it contains all the required EOR information and is sent to you within the required time frame. Otherwise, you guessed it, the claims administrator is in breach and you can file a lien. The next question is from Christy. Is the Daisy Bill EOR invalid if the carrier fails to upload the EOR or sends the EOR via mail? So for electronic bills, the rules require a claims administrator to send a timely and complete electronic EOR. The electronic EOR in Daisy Bill is always valid. In order to be compliant, electronic EORs must contain all the required information per Appendix B. Our next question is from Julie. How do we get a claim processed when the TPA forwards us to the claims administrator? Then the claims administrator states that we must go through the TPA. The TPA is the claims administrator. Both self-insured employers and insurers hire third-party administrators to act as their claims administrators. And in our first webinar, Master the Basics, we cover all of the roles and their associated responsibilities. It's a terrific webinar. So we definitely suggest that you take a look at that. Next is from Ron. Does the claims administrator have a responsibility to let a provider know what might be delaying the claim, such as an updated W-9? If your bill is contested and you submit it electronically, you must receive an EOR within 15 working days. If you submitted the contested bill on paper, you must receive that EOR within 30 days. And missing a W-9 constitutes an incomplete bill, so the EOR must include that the W-9 is the additional information required to make a decision. So yes, they must tell you that. From Naji, what is the complete list of valid objections to make, an EOR, make in an EOR to a copy service? So most often copy services are medical legal services, therefore the MedLegal EOR rules apply. And when issuing the EOR for medical legal bills, including copy service bills, payers must follow the requirements of Labor Code 4603.3. So while we move on to the questions that came in today, I want to put my contact information up on the screen. Please feel free to take this down, and this is how you can reach out to us directly. As we mentioned a couple times during the webinar, um, Daisy Billers certainly reach out to us with questions as well, including any questions about petitions if you are submitting medical legal bills. So let's get to some of the questions that have come in during the webinar today. Okay, so our first question is, so if we have only one year to bill our date of service, what happens if we are treating the patient and the applicant attorney doesn't have carrier information? Can we still bill for that date of service? Or we can't because it has passed that one year mark from the time we saw the patient. So at Daisy Bill, we recommend that providers always speak with the claims administrator prior to providing services. The only exception should be emergency treatment. Obviously, if there's an emergency, you need to treat that patient immediately. If liability for the claim is contested, the claims administrator must inform you of that dispute. But if you don't have the claims administrator information, there's no way for them to contact you or you to contact them. So providers do not treat injured workers without knowing who the claims administrator is. Also on our website, we have a intake form. It includes all the things that we think that you should ask. So look on our website um, and you can find that intake form or reach out to me and I can direct you to the correct place. Next question is, how do we get reimbursed for the cost of filing a lien? Well, if you prevail, the lien cost can be included in the settlement. So it's something you can certainly negotiate. Next question, is there a time frame to submit the missing documentation? Um, so you must submit a timely second review with that additional information. And the second review timeframe requirements is within 90 days from the date of receipt of the EOR. 
feel like we say this in every single webinar, but that 90 days can go quickly. So do not wait till day 80 or 85. Submit those second reviews in a timely manner and include that additional information that's request, requested on the EOR. Did I hear correctly that the provider pays a price to submit a lien? Yes, providers pay um, the fees for both independent bill reviews, which are IBRs, as well as liens. The IBR fee is $195 and the lien fee is $150. And yes, the provider submits those fees. Where can I find an explanation of the codes used by psychologists to bill for psychological services? I purchased the manual but uh, put out by the WC administration, but the codes there appear to be incomplete. Um, so the actual procedure codes that you're submitting to the carrier on your bills are found in the AMA CPT book. Within the Medical Billing and Payment Guide, at the end of that guide is a link to the AMA site where you can purchase those CPT books. Um, so it is the AMA CPT book where you can find the actual codes that should go on your bills. Next is what is the time frame for lien processing? It depends on a number of issues. Um, one of the most important issues is whether the case in chief is settled. So it can take a bit of time for those liens to be processed. Um, but uh, it's certainly the, the route that you should take if you're receiving incomplete EORs or not receiving EORs at all. If I never receive an EOR and call to request one and it is dated past the 90 days for SBR filing, is there a way to contest this or perhaps contest that the bill was received on the date listed? If it was confirmed via telephone by bill review or claims adjuster, I think is what it's saying, with the date of service later than what is printed on the EOR received upon request. So I think that what you should do is switch to electronic billing. That's our official recommendation. This just doesn't happen when you e-bill. So e-billing provides transparency, um, and it provides you the ability to know precisely when bills are responded to. Next, for bills that are not medical but are authorized by judgment or stipulation, do the work comp regulations still apply? Cedric Bill Review informed me that the claims adjuster has discretion to pay the bill. They are not involved as it is an expense. The rules and regulations and the labor code covered today only apply to services that are covered under labor code 4600. Next is, is it, is it okay to send SBRs to MedRisk? They have told us they do not do this. So your contract is with MedRisk and to the extent that MedRisk did not pay you correctly, this is not covered by second reviews. You would need to deal directly with med risk. So those are special contracts that you are engaging in. They're not claims administrators. Um, so you would need to refer to your contract and reach out to med risk directly to figure out what that process is. Here's another med risk question. Is it med risk's responsibility to pay us timely? They forever tell us they are, quote, waiting on payment from the carrier. Again, this is similar to the previous question, but once you sign one of those network contracts, you lose all of the rights allowed by the DWC. You are a servant to the details of your contract, so review your contracts before you sign them. Review your contracts that you've already signed. It is very important to know what you have agreed to when you've signed on to those contracts. Med legal bills sent via electronic, does the 15 days also apply, or is it 60? It is 60, so there is... Um, it's always 60 days regardless of the method of submission, electronic or paper. Looks like we have a lot of questions um, in our, our most frequently asked question of what to do if we don't receive a response, which we've gone over several times. So I'm going to skip over some of those. Um, and I'm going to answer one last question here for today. How long does the claims administrator, sh how long does claims administrator review an SBR? What do you do if it has reached three months and the SBR is still pending in process? So the claims administrator has 14 days to respond to your second bill review. They have 21 days to issue any additional payment. If they do not do this, if they breach their duty, you should file a lien and assert the breach of duty. You will be owed the full amount of the bill. Here's the, the, the real important part, though. Make sure that you have proof of receipt. So as we mentioned before, submit your bills with a proof of service, or even easier than that is submit your bills electronically and compliantly. And as always, we can certainly answer any questions about electronic billing if you reach out to us directly. And again, my contact information is on the screen. That's my direct phone number, my email address. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And again, I'll remind you to sign up for the next webinar. Ask us questions in those webinars. The more questions you ask, the more we will answer. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on November 16th. Have a great day.